What's up guys, Pete Clark here and in today's video we're going to be doing something a little bit more sentimental and personal. We're going to have a heart to heart about my poker future and the most exciting part of this perhaps for you guys in terms of what you're going to be able to see from me in the upcoming months is this. We are going to be back in the fray competing once again at the forefront right in the battle. We were doing this this morning, we were getting our feet wet with volume again and we're going to be back on the grind trying to prove that we still have what it takes after a bit of a hiatus from putting in high volume where I've been building my coaching and teaching business, creating and teaching the Carrot Poker School and just basically been making most of my money outside of the felt itself from actually teaching the game. But we're restructuring the business in the next couple of months in a way that's actually going to be freeing up a bunch of time for me to put in sessions once again. We're going to be doing this a lot of the time on stream. We're going to be giving you guys YouTube content of these sessions as well. And I'm going to be trying to prove myself over a large sample. This video is going to be a mix of play and more revelations about my poker future. So without any further ado, let's get into a hand that I played a couple hours ago. So in this first spot, we have kings in the big blind. And we face a 2.5 BB open from hijack. We're going to go ahead and 3-bet here. Something like 12 or 13 is good. Wanting to go fairly large in the big blind due to the polarization of the range that you are constructing here. Your value hands are very, very good and want to play big pots. Meanwhile, your bluffs are fairly happy to, to do this as well. Ace-3 deuce, interesting board. I think ace-3 deuce two-tone is one of these flops against under the gun where we don't have to be betting range here. I think we want to build a, a checking range here and bet small some of the time, I think kings with the king of clubs can probably bet small or check. I think kings without the king of clubs would probably be a pure check in this strategy and facing a bet this hand will be a, a complete full frequency continue. I would imagine because the club at this stage in the hand is actually good. We make it harder for villain straws to get there. We have extra equity ourselves. What we don't want is to have this card on the river in certain nodes, but in other ones it will actually be quite good. So these flush drop blockers can be a bit tricky. So we do decide to check call, we check the ace turn, one of the better turns for our hand for sure, other than a king, this is possibly the best turn in the deck that's not the club, it just reduces the combos of ace x in our opponent's range here. But the reason I wouldn't be betting everything on the flop there is the villain just has some 4s, some 5s, 4-5s four suited, and also it's just not amazing for us when we're big blind, a lot of our bluffs are like king x suited and stuff here, it's just hopelessly whiffed, so we have a much weaker range than we do in the small blind. So it goes check check on the turn, which it will fairly frequently. We get to this river with a decision. Do we want to go for some thin value here and block or do we want to check? I think our hand makes a very, excuse me, it's my broken part of my headset just falls into my face as I'm recording. We're not gonna edit that out because it's obviously comedy value for you guys. But yeah, we, we could block here for value. The problem is that villain's range for betting the flop here will be fairly polarized. Like I think he'll have some vulnerable under pairs like sevens eights and sixes doing this that could consider bluff catching but he won't have a lot of those mediocre showdown value hands he will still have a lot of ace x in his range and many of his hands that bluff the flop will just not have any showdown value and we may do better by getting villain to bluff again here when we think about what we unblock here and i say this to my students a lot in carrot poker school grade three where we focus on unblockers for a few classes Unblocking the bluffing range in the river is very important. We also block the value range here because king, queen or king, jack of clubs could check back and then go for a large bet on the river. And we unblock such bluffs as jack 10, queen jack 10, 9 suited, 5, 6 suited, 7, 6 suited, 8, 7 suited, and hands of this nature. So I think the most intuitive way to play kings with a club here is to either check jam as a bluff or check call and which of those we choose will depend on what we roll and villain size and if villain goes for a smaller bet here i don't think we're doing any raise because we're just going to have way too good a call against a very large bet this could be the type of hand that gets a bit weird sometimes and throws in some raise i could be wrong about that though so we check and our opponent thinks for a bit and goes for this sizing this is the kind of sizing I would expect from a hand such as ace-jack or ace-10 or ace-queen here. It looks kind of normal. This is what we would call a tier 2 hand in our school. A hand with maybe 75 to 80, something like that, percent equity. And it wants to go for this sort of bet size. I think all of our options here make sense. Jam is something I did not actually consider here in game. Call makes sense. I don't actually think fold makes sense here because our blocker is just too good. Our hand is doing a good job of unblocking bluffs here and 
blocking value bet. So I think we either call or raise. I did just go for the for the call in game fairly quickly. However, if I had time to go back and think about this, like where are my bluff raises coming from? If not from this hand, then I'm not really sure. And it does make a lot of sense to raise here also. So you could check that out in your solver. Let me know what the verdict is there, but I'm pretty sure that raise is also going to end up being an option for this hand. Guys, I'm really happy, but I'm also really sad. I'm sad because this April is going to be the last chance that you have to set our live university style experience of the Carrot Poker School. After that, the school is going to be switching from a live format to a slick professional video course, which will be on sale at carrotcorner.com. This April, I'll be teaching each grade in two hours only. Each class will be going from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. UK time, Monday to Friday which is the same thing as 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time or 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Grade 1 is going to be running from the 11th to the 15th of April. Grade 2 will run from the 18th to the 22nd. And Grade 3 will be the final week of the month from the 25th to the 29th of April. Signing up for the Carrot Poker School takes just a few button clicks. Simply head on over to carrotcorner.com and select the grade that you want to take. Or alternatively, why not set our entire full scholarship experience and save £500 while you're at it? If you're not sure which grade to take, you can always get in touch with me on Discord. Just add me there as carrots hashtag 9127. If you do sign up for the school, do the same thing, add me there, and you'll be added to our Carrot Poker Discord server and become a part of the community. Let's get back to the video. Another thing that I feel very passionately about still, and I've been doing this for the last decade, is one-to-one -one coaching. You can find me as a coach over at carrotcorner.com forward slash coaching. If you have not decided yet whether you should have a coach, I can say that one of the most fulfilling journeys I've ever been on in my life is helping students. I think like both ends of the student coach dynamic are just really great when it works it can be a really magical thing and this is something I'm definitely not going to be giving up so while I am restructuring the business this year I definitely still consider coaching to remain a reasonable part of my poker future but what I would say as a caveat here is that I need to be careful with how many students I take on there was a period maybe a couple of years ago when COVID first boomed can you say that? Did it boom? Well, whatever. When COVID first blew up and it had ramifications on the world, obviously, one of those was that people were in their houses doing more online stuff. A lot of people came back to online poker who had been playing previously and had maybe taken a hiatus. That led to a lot of coaching requests and I was in a kind of, well, I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. Let me take on all of these students. Let me work myself into the ground. I remember one Wednesday, when I actually taught nine sessions, almost back to back. And I remember by the end of the last session, I was on the verge of like some kind of anxiety slash panic attack. I just overworked myself. I was binging on caffeine during the day to make it through the sessions. I was having too many glasses of wine in the evening to try to unwind. It was a bad cycle. When I look back on it now, it was, although it was like short term monetary gain, it was not a shrewd business like or life decision. So one thing I will say is that as I go through the next few years of my business, I will do one-to-ones, but I'll make sure I'm doing few of them, a few enough of them that I'm actually really focused, I'm dedicated to the student, and I'm passionate about it and enjoying the sessions. I don't want to overwork myself, basically, but yeah, one-to-one -one coaching, hugely beneficial thing for students to get someone that can tailor their game specifically, tailor the sessions specifically to their game, to their needs, and yeah, I look forward to doing more of this. Let's have a look at another spot. This next hand features the 7-6 of hearts in the big blind. Villain opens to 3x and we decide to call this time. 3 betting at some frequency would be acceptable. He checks the flop and I have a think to myself. Again, I'm trying to decide here which sizing my value range wants to use. I'm trying to get my strategy down to just one bet here. So either I use that sizing or I check. When I think about it here, I decided that I don't really need to value bet many hands worse than a good 10. I was quite happy checking back all 7x on this node because the board is a little bit wetter and 7x is not going to be that strong a hand that's so in need of betting for value slash denial. On a board that's a bit drier, like 10 for 3, I'll probably deploy a small betting strategy on flop here and that's so that I can bet a lot of hands like jack 7, a 7, things like this as well, pocket eights, etc. I was quite happy just making something like jack 10 or queen 10, 10, 9 maybe, the start of my value range here and thus using a big sizing. I think as well with 10, 7, 6, given that we have 16 combos of 8, 9 potentially here, not quite that many because we three bet a couple of the suited ones sometimes, but we have 14 or 15 combos of 8, 9 here. 
we're going to have the nut advantage for sure when we face a check here. I think using a big bet makes sense for the top of my range. And yeah, I just think that's a really important skill is to think about your value region, decide what sizing it wants to use, and then deploy that strategy. Don't be inconsistent there. It's just going to mess you up. Villain checks turn. Again, I go into the tank and I do the same thing. I'm trying to decide here what sizing does my range want to use on a five. I don't think my opponent has a ton of new nutted hands in this card. A lot of his 8-9 combos are going to be raising flop, betting flop. It's maybe they check call sometimes, but it's not really a big deal. I think, by and large, his range is very condensed here to things like over pairs, 10x pair, plus draw, plus draw. And my range contains some of those hands as well, but it's going to have the monopoly on combos like 7-6 seven, six is 7-6. Seven, six. 8-9, eight, eight, and then, yeah, that'll be the bulk of my value range. So if it's worth betting again here, I really think it's worth just overbetting. That does mean that if I have a hand like King-10, I'm just going to be checking here, but I think that's totally reasonable, having bet flop big. Villain calls the overbet. This is always good news. We bolt up on the river, so running well in this hand, which is nice because this session did not go well overall. And, yeah, I mean, realistically, there is just, just nothing to do here but jam. There's a theorem in the Carrot Poker School Grade 2 called Greed Theorem, and there's a similar one in Grade 3 called Glutton Theorem. We're all about the theorems at the Carrot Poker School. And what Greed Theorem really says is that in spots where your opponent is not going to be doing very much raising against your bet because they have a more condensed range than you, and you have a, a way more polar range than they have, the optimal sizing for your nutted region is the biggest sizing possible. As we said in a, a past video, um, the five principles of value betting, we said the goal of value betting is not to get called, and that's 100% true. The goal of value betting here is to win as much as you can when you do get called and give your hand the maximal investment possible. That's what 7-6 wants to do. It wants to go ahead and win all of the money the times it's going to get called. There's a mathematical proof for this that I won't bore you with right now, but if you really want to see that, ask me in the comments. Maybe I'll share it. But that's another thing where you want to be aware that the bigger you go, the more money you make, unless villain is dramatically overfolding to one size, but not another size, and it has to be by a big margin. So yeah, not a spot where we expect to get raised a lot. Villain's range is many bluff catchers, such as this one. This is a very good bluff catcher. He makes the call here with 10-8 of hearts. I think this makes sense. He has blockers to 8-9. I think it's possibly better for him if he has spades here, paradoxically, because he actually wants to unblock my bluffs, and I'm not really bluffing with spades too often on this node. I have plenty of other bluffs I could use instead, like 9x and 8x combos. So maybe his 8 is a bit better sweet. It does block some bluffs and some value, but when your opponent goes huge like I did, it becomes more important to just block value hands at the top of the range, and so I quite like this call. The 10 is also going to block 10-6 and basically just never be 10-6 of hearts, yeah it is, and it's never going to be a, a negative blocker to have a 10 here. So this call looks reasonable, it's probably a lot better to call with a hand like this than it is to call with a hand like Queen Jack, that's just not going to really block any value bets and it's going to block bluffs like Queen 8 or Jack 8. So I think both players played this hand absolutely fine and we scoop a nice pot. There we go, scoop. Another thing that I'm going to be doing very soon is bringing you guys high quality video courses. This is kind of the, the way of things these days. Businesses want to make money while they sleep. I want to be asleep and I want people buying my videos. I don't want to always have to be there to teach Carrot Poker School. I've really loved following in my dad's footsteps and becoming a lecturer of a topic. He was a university lecturer, so I had to make my own university because it wasn't poker wasn't taught in universities really exception of MIT for like one weird module or something. We're going to be doing it in video course form instead now. You guys are going to have the chance to pick up some quality production slick videos. The Carrot Poker School is going to be on CarrotCorner.com in its entirety. We have another really fun course coming soon as well called Cash Injection, which is all going to be about how to make the most money possible by making as few changes as possible. It's basically the highest value changes that you could make to your game to help you climb out of maybe a stake that you're stuck at, low stake, micro stake, um, something like that. So Cash Injection, really looking forward to that one. And yeah, this is the future of the business and it's this change going over to the video course format that's freeing up all the time for me to make the changes, the other changes here, um, playing more especially. So, so yeah, looking forward to this. Stay Keep your eye on carrotcorner.com for all of our instructional video courses. Let's do another hand. In this next spot we have Jax. We face an open from a player I don't recognize and what's certainly a recreational player in the cutoff. 
I think although this hand is theoretically a mixed action, it's very important to squeeze here because you're just wanting to isolate this player in the cutoff. You're going to have a skill edge on plus position on. And yeah, I don't really see the incentive in flatting here and letting two strong regs come along in the blinds. That's what the yellow tags are, are generally solid regs. So I, I tag this guy as recreational. He checks the flop. If you're watching, Hawa9999, no offense. Maybe you're like a poker ball or boss. I just didn't know you at the time. So please don't take offense to me giving you a recreational tag. There's nothing wrong with calling in the cutoff. It's just that most people that do are recreational. This is interesting. I go for a small bet here. I think this makes sense with Jack specifically at this SBR. I don't actually mind just reverting to a simple approach of playing my hand here instead of thinking too heavily about GTO or my range. And I think that by the time I've big bet and then made lots of other future investments with this hand at the stack depth, I'm going to be really unhappy in a lot of different permutations. So I think the best reality here for me, the most frequently, is the one where I keep the pot a little bit smaller, I give myself the option to play bigger pots and smaller pots depending on the run out, but unless the turn is like the three of hearts or something really good like that, I don't think I'm going to be building gigantic pots here as often as you might think. The Ace of Clubs is obviously a, a fairly bad turn because Villain can be floating flop here with Ace Queen, things like that. It can also just improve his um, Ace 10, Ace 9 combos and of course the weaker players will sometimes do goofy stuff with Ace King and show up with that hand here, even though they shouldn't have it. At the other end of the spectrum of his range are hands like 6s and 7s and 8s and they're going to go away usually if I bet again here, so it doesn't really make sense to bet here. Even if he has King Queen, he may do something weird like raise a small bet and you know, force me to fold and put me in a world of pain. So I think just checking back here, don't quote me on saying a world of pain. That's not normally a, that's not an academic term, guys. Like, let's just forget I said that. But yeah, I think check back here makes makes the most sense by far. I don't know why I had to pause that because I'm probably going to tank for a while like I always do. I'm so tanky sometimes. Like it's the most standard check in the world and I'm like, man, I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I could just bet like seven bigs, you know, that might be right. I'd be right to bet seven bigs. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, seven bigs or check, seven bigs or check. Let's just check. Queen of Spades, kind of nightmare run out. We are still winning against seven, sixes, eights. These are a lot of combos. Recreational players will also have weird stuff like nine, seven, ten, eight. 3-5, 3-4 suited, stuff like this here. So his range is a lot wider than it might look at first glance. That doesn't mean I'm going to be bluff catching, but then my opponent goes ahead and does something a bit weird. He does this. This. There we go, second time. Thought it was going to be three or four times. And I, I went into the tank again. Again, Tanky Pete likes to go into the tank, so I started tanking because it's what I do best. And I was like, well, look, this is just a fold, right? And I've, look, at, I've, I've pressed the fold button, guys. Look at this. The fold button is pressed. All I have to do is release the fold button and it will go off. If this was real life, there would be no way to stop this button going off. It would literally just be like, I'd be sitting with my finger over it, waiting to release it, and then it would fold. So it'd be too late if this was a real life button. But this is an online button. And online buttons can be unpressed. That's right. They can be unpressed like this. Look, I just unpressed it. And then I start thinking a bit more. I'm like, well, okay, I'm getting like five and a half to one. This means that I need like 18% equity to call here profitably. And is 18% of this guy's range a bluff? Like seven, sixes, something that's bluffing now, quite possibly. Or even weirder, but very common in the recreational side of the pool, is villain just like spewing with like 10-8? Is he just got like jack nine? And, or king nine or king ten and you know what I just decided that there's no way I'm folding here because like I think sixes sevens eights fives fours king ten king nine like all these weird hands bear in mind he didn't even three bet pre so who knows how many ace queen or queens or ace ten or something he even has like who knows so I decided to call here I think it's the right play I think you just have to close your eyes and accept that you'll beat weird bluffs and you'll beat weird merges in the spot often enough and villain sizing here like when when recreationals make small bets like this it's actually quite over bluffed usually so yeah he bets a hand that just looks like a normal check like third pair like he has many worse hands to bluff with there like sevens eights nines etc he shouldn't really be bluffing with this hand on this texture it's just a bit bizarre but there you go that's the kind of thing that they do and for that reason time all the way down to one fucking second because that's the kind of guy i am what slow roll 
for that reason, I don't really like folding hands as high up as jacks. I like to actually think about where something is in my range against a recreational in terms of how high up it is and not in terms of its blockers as much. Another thing that you guys have to look forward to is that I'm going to also have way more time for YouTube content. Like this video, I'm going to be getting as imaginative as possible, trying to grow the channel and hopefully entertaining you guys when you get home from work and you need something to tune into. Carrot Corner will be there for you. Maybe one day it will be a daily basis, who knows. Also Twitch, the Twitch channel is its kind of taking over at the moment, but I don't have a lot of time to really put in the, the grinding and streaming hours to do it justice, but Twitch is going to go hand in hand with the whole getting back into the arena. Pete's going to battle again, that sort of thing. So I'm going to play most of my volume. In fact, who am I kidding? I'm going to play basically all of my volume on stream and you guys can follow me tilting the good days, the bad days, the jubilation, the anguish, anguish, the anguish, the foul language as well. I was thinking about me swearing when I, when I was talking about anguish. So there we go. We blended anguish and language there. But we also have lots of other cool streams that we do sometimes like coaching Chris and we have other professionals like Akshar, my friend on the show and we have my friend Sam on there doing cool commentary and we just love to, to hang out and have a good time so check out carrot underscore corners twitch channel for more you can find a link in the comments for that and yeah let's let's look at another hand so in this video the exact same spot came up twice this was the other time that we had kings and basically had to play another ace high board it was almost an identical spot so again you might not want to bet all of your range on a board like Ace Eight Six, where you have two of these set making cards for villain on on something like Ace Nine Deuce or Ace Ten Five that gets Broadway ish, and you can hit like King Queen and King Jack and stuff or happier. Your Ten X doesn't with. You can definitely bet range on this board. I do like to build a checking range for better or for worse. I think that's fine. As I'm doing that, Kings is going to get into it pretty frequently. I actually don't mind checking this one a bit more with these com with this combo here. The thing is that the King of Clubs hands that Villain has are really dead here, so I don't mind giving a free card to King X of Clubs, I mind giving a free card to like King X of Diamonds or Hearts a bit more. So you might see me actually bet a bit more often with the King of Clubs in my hand on this node, but I don't think it's a, a big deal. So I decided to check this time. I think Kings is going to be like approaching pure check here. I did roll it though and I rolled a big number and big numbers are, are more passive for me. I probably had some idea in my head there of, of what number I was looking for to, to make a rare bet with that hand and usually, usually checking. Villain has a think and he does as people like to do. They just love to bet one third when checked to, right? Like who doesn't love to bet one third when checked to? What a fun way to play. You don't even have to think, you don't even need to use your brain at all. It's great. Villain bets, and I'm not saying this guy's like a non-thinking poker idiot by the way, I'm just saying a lot of people will use that bet a bit too automatically. So easy check call with kings, the thing is here that his bluffs are very far behind kings, if we had like nines his bluffs would be in much better shape. So kings is definitely one that we don't want to fold to this sizing. Ace turn, his range is still a bit more polar than ours because we check called the flop so I don't think we want to be leading here. I briefly considered whether we build the leading range, I don't think we do at all on any card here actually and he checks back so we have exactly the same spot once again and again I just feel like if I bet here the idea is that well he's polarized his range a bit on the flop this time I seem to be blocking mostly the draws that he wouldn't bet on the flop like I'm unblocking sorry I'm blocking the, the draws that he would bet on the flop and sometimes bet on the turn with so the king of hearts here I don't actually mind this card at all because when villain is bluffing the river he's not going to have the king of hearts in his hand and there's two reasons for that one he doesn't want to block my own busted heart draws and two he will bet the king of hearts on the turn pretty damn frequently so for the most part this is not a bad blocker this king of hearts is not a bad blocker so again what are his bluffs well they're going to be like lower cards there'll be things like jack 10 queen jack queen 10 queen 9 suited jack 9 suited that sort of stuff so again kings it just looks like a fairly good bluff catcher out again i'm pretty happy do we want to be jamming with this particular kings no like here if we want to be jamming we want to have a weird hand like i don't even know what our bluff jams would be here actually it's a really interesting question they would be very rare guests in our range but i don't know what they would actually be you'll need to have a look at that later how do i find a bluff jam here like like what the hell is that hand let me know in the chat what is the hand of bluff jams here anyway we decide to call this one it's a really similar spot to before i think it's just a premium bluff catch this time we run into the boat can't win them all right win one lose one pretty good one one out of two i'll take it we don't need to win one out of two times guys when we're when we're bluff catching your brain might tell you that you do but you don't and finally more time for life another thing that will change in my poker future paradoxically is that poker will not take up as much of my poker future as it has in the past. 
poker, my career, my business, it's all been a bit sub-optimized. Like it's not been running like clockwork. We've not had the store up with the courses yet. All of these things I've, ha I've been having to put in a lot of man hours teaching. And when that's no longer the case, I'll be able to live life again. That means more time for other hobbies. There's a lot of other things I enjoy doing. I'll be able to spend more time with my girlfriend, with friends, all sorts of things. And I'll also be able to just enjoy where I am a bit more. I live out in the middle of nowhere and I have goats and chickens and, and things like that. But sometimes I feel like I work all day and then it's dark and I don't even see my animals and stuff. So certainly enjoying the small things in life more being able to get better at chess. I really do want to like become a chess master one day and I'm still only like 1800 and it's just not happening for me yet. But I'll be able to put in some more study hours, play some more tournaments. Hopefully um, myself and my girlfriend will be able to get better at bridge and, and kick some old people's asses and just dominate the bridge scene. That would be good too. So loads of stuff that I look forward to doing when things are optimized. And yeah, guys, thank you for, for following this YouTube content and for checking it out, for watching me on Twitch and and supporting me um, thus far and I hope that way more good things are going to be I'll be able to bring you guys way more good things very soon stay tuned for for Pete getting back on the grind and for loads more interesting video formats for everything from me check out carrotconnor.com and I'll see you guys on the next video much love and bye for now